Hello, and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I am your host, Scott Brady, and I am here with my co-host, Matt Scott. What are we going to talk about today, Matt? So today we're talking about something really important, maybe some stuff that you guys are going to disagree with. We're talking about the 10 commandments of modifying your Overland vehicle. Now, the key thing there is Overland. We're talking about vehicles that are being modified for travel as their, uh, you know, as, as their main purpose, right? I mean, exactly. Yeah. People oftentimes think that, oh, that overlanding is recreational four wheeling. There's certainly some fun you can have while overlanding doing recreational four wheeling things, but overlanding is vehicle based travel. Whereas four wheeling is recreational sport. It's just important to understand the distinction and that we're not really building vehicles across a Rubicon. If that's what you want to do, that's great. But it, the Rubicon tends to not be um, a, de- a destination for travel; it tends to be a destination for recreational sport. Yeah, just just rent a jeep if if yeah. if, you, if, if if you want to do the Rubicon. You know, the, I guess the you know the, the old quote that a uh, what the jack of all trades is a master of none. Right? Totally. You know, we're we're specifically going to be talking about vehicles for travel, lightly modified vehicles that you know are are essentially built to be durable and a little bit more refined because you're going to be spending a lot of time in these things. Um, and, we, and we want them to be simple because we don't want the vehicle to be a distraction from the experience. We also exactly. don't want to spend a bunch of money on the vehicle either. We talked about this in a previous podcast, but uh, we always want to make sure that we're spending less money on the vehicle than we are on the travel itself. So when you go down through your expenses at the end of the year, if you spent four times more on the truck than you did on any of your travels, it might be worth reconsidering. Well, maybe I'm just into building vehicles and that's my hobby and that's okay. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that, but if you're, if your goal is to really be a traveler, if your goal is to really be an overlander, make sure that that, that Delta is different where you're spending more money on fuel and going interesting places and, and um, you know, getting access to that one remote museum or, or paying that border crossing yeah. fee, make sure that you're spending money on travel more so than you're spending yeah, and, on and invest into yourself. Right. Um, and that, and that can manifest itself in a, in a bunch of different ways. Let's say you only have a week of vacation. Well, spend the $2,000 that you were going to, you know, put into a lift kit or, or, or whatever it may be and take unpaid leave, find a new career, teach yourself skills, whatever, whatever, it, whatever it is. Right. Um, you know, if, if the goal is travel, I think that yeah, has make to that maintain, priority. that has to maintain priority. So, and, and you can, this article that we're talking about has been on expedition portal for years and we recently uh, updated it. And that's what Matt and I are talking about today. It's called the 10 commandments of, of modifying your overland vehicle. And it's, it's really important to know that the, the title is intentionally, um, uh, aggressive. It, it sounds like we're trying to tell you how to do things and that's not the case. It's more of a way of gaining people's attention to be mindful about how they modify their vehicles. So these aren't commandments. You can do whatever you want, obviously with your own truck. These are the things that Matt and I have learned um, many of them the hard way yeah. uh, by doing things. Do you exactly remember up. my first Jeep when I started working for Overland Journal? Oh my I remember God. my first Jeep, which was totally oh. overloaded and, and problematic. I remember, yeah, I put a, a 289 V8 into a 1953 M38A1. No wonder it ended up being a total disaster. Yeah. Total ten, disaster. 10 years ago, I thought the measure of a good vehicle is how much stuff was bolted onto it. And I quickly learned that the measure of a good vehicle is kind of almost how stock it is, right? Yeah. I mean, look or at where like, it's been. Where it's been, yeah, right? You um, go. you know, I, I'm more concerned with properly aligned geometry on my suspension than I am that the the height of it. Yeah, for um, sure. You know, I look at like AEV, for example, I think AEV does a really good, um, a really good job of, of kind of getting into this first, this first commandment as we're calling them is that complexity is the enemy, right? Um, you know, the, the original manufacturer of your vehicle, um, put a lot of work into it. And I think people, you know, and I I know a lot of these head engineers of these car companies and the testing, the, the, the hundreds of thousands of miles that these vehicles are proven you are, you are never going to be able to recreate that a, a, you know, an aftermarket company. They're designed for a specific task. Exactly. And, and maybe that's the first question that we ask is why are you buying the vehicle that you're buying? If you want something that has a, a good payload that's designed to go around the world, you're going to be looking at a very small group of vehicles. Uh, It doesn't mean that you can't drive around the world in a Subaru, but if you want to cross the canning stock route or you want to do or you want to cross glaciers in Iceland, that's not the right vehicle. It would require so much modification 
to make that possible. Yeah. Start with the right platform. Start with the that's right going to reduce complexity. It um, will. Let's say you wanted to have a four wheel camper. Great option. You know, everything's all in one. You can, you can ditch it, have your truck back during the week. Should you, should you start with a Tacoma? It's not the right vehicle. It's probably not the right vehicle. Cause yeah, the then you're going to have to add low. complexity. You're going to have to add some fancy trick rear springs to support the weight. Maybe some airbags, maybe some shocks you know, that have insane compression rates on them. So you're not bottoming out all the time, or you could just throw it in the back of an F-150 and be done. Yeah. Or a 2,500 or 2,500 or, 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 or whatever, whatever where that's designed to carry that kind of payload. So I think it just comes back to us being honest with ourselves of like, what do we actually want to accomplish? What are we trying to, where are we trying to go? Where are we trying to travel? And then buying the right vehicle to start off with. If the goal is to cross the sand sand dunes in the Altar Desert, then that 2,500 Dodge with a four-wheel camper is probably not the best choice for that either. So thinking about where you want to go and what you want to experience along the way. Some people love staying in cities, small villages, and they need to have a small vehicle. They intend to, they don't want to camp out every night and buy the right vehicle for that. And maybe that is the Subaru that you choose maybe for that, is, for that yeah. type of travel. Um, but it's really important to start off with the right vehicle. And, and when Matt talks about complexity, let's remind ourselves that Whatever we add to the vehicle is going to be a distraction. It's going to take away money that we could use for travel. It's going to take away time because we have to install it or modify it, uh, do that modification ourselves, or we have to pay for someone else to do it. And then now we don't know how to fix it ourselves. Um, so there's a lot of consequences for anything that we add to the car. Yeah. I mean, I, I, Scott, I think you'd agree. Um, erring on the side of, of being OE, um, not making modifications that can't be fixed wherever you may be going not adding a, a very obscure tire size. That means you're going to be waiting for tires for two weeks in Ecuador. Um, just, just thinking of the entire picture, right? I mean, when you, when you add a larger tire size to your vehicle, people don't necessarily know all of that, all, all which it affects, right? I mean, you're going to be changing your braking distance, right? Cause if your Land Cruiser came with a 31 inch tire, well, your braking, your stopping distance is based around that. Um, you're going to be putting more strain in your U joints. You're going to be putting more strain in your transmission because it's not going to be in the right cooling, shift zone. Cooling capacity. Cooling right. capacity. Like there's every action has a reaction, right? I mean, that is, that's the law of the universe, I guess. Yeah. Right. So it also applies to vehicles. So, so, so keep that in mind. Um, you know, for me, weight is just, is the biggest thing, right? I, on an Overland vehicle. Um, and this is, this is, I guess, our second it point. It is. Our um, point number two. Weight is the enemy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when, when we talk about cargo capacity, and I do think that that term is almost misleading, that, that's actually the vehicle's capacity, right. right? That means if your forerunner, which I want to say is around 1,500 pounds, has 1,500 pounds of cargo capacity, that doesn't mean the stuff that goes in the back. That means the stuff that goes in the front seat and the passenger seat. It means the stuff that goes in the fuel tank. Um, all of those things, they're, they're not included, right? So figure two American males, 200 pounds each, there's 400 pounds. So now you're down to 1100 pounds. Um, let's say you have 10 gallons of water, gallon of water is eight, eight point three three. Yeah. Okay. So we're just going to call that a, you know, we'll call that a hundred pounds. Then you start talking fuel that's seven pounds and you have a 25 gallon gas tank. I'm going to stop doing math here, but it adds up really it quickly, adds up really quick, right? And then you start talking about your 200 pound sliders and you put bigger tires on it, which means you have nowhere to carry your spare. So you have to put this 250 pound rear bumper on. Oh, well, then you did a rear bumper. So you have to do the front one. And all of a sudden your payload capacity is that of a very, very petite ham, ham sandwich. Um, so keep that stuff in mind. I mean, I, I don't know, as a traveler, I guess I would rather fill that with I don't know, rosé or something, you know, stuff that, you know, stuff that you're going to enjoy in camp. You know, I, I like or the to, ability to, to pick up some hitchhikers as you're going along. I remember stopping and picking up these Tarahumara Indians in, in Copper Canyon. And like I was driving a sportsmobile van that was a one ton capacity. It had yeah. plenty of payload to carry additional people, plenty of space. So starting off with, with making that decision of, I'm not going to overload my vehicle past uh, 90% of the gross vehicle weight, uh, which means that you've got to have a little bit extra. What if your vehicle that you're traveling with, your, your travel partners that have another vehicle, what if they break down in the middle of the desert 
and you need to move them over to your vehicle. Do you have the room for that? Do you have an unloaded open roof rack to take their equipment? Um, those are all consequences of us overdoing the vehicles. Um, and we, we have to remember that so much of this comes from a, a place of insecurity. And I don't mean just like that people are insecure, so they're over overbuilding their vehicles to compensate, which I think that that's probably true in some cases. It's actually this insecurity of if I break down, I want to have everything that I could possibly have. Or if I run into this really obscure situation in Africa, I want to be able to overcome it with this one widget that I brought along. The reality is, is that those things don't typically happen. There's normally locals driving around in their own Land Cruiser that can pull you out or a, a village will, un, you know, the whole village will come over to help push you out. Yeah, yeah, they'll exactly. Hook, they'll, they'll hook up oxen to the front of your car. I mean, it's, that's part of the adventure is getting stuck. And part of the adventure is having issues that you may not be able to solve everything all at once. So making sure that you don't over plan and overbuild the vehicle is a key to adventure. Yeah, you don't need to carry the you know, the portable welder to fix your frame when it fails, if you don't overload your vehicle and your frame doesn't fail. Yeah. Right. It's that self-deprecating cycle of, you know. Yeah. The only time I needed a welder, I mean, needed a welder was in the middle of Antarctica. And that's because there was no other way to fix it. If you're in the middle of Africa, I guarantee you that the next village has a welder. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it doesn't mean that you should, no one should ever bring a welder. We're not saying that we're not saying no one should ever put 35s on their vehicle, do what works for you, but just make sure that everything is with intention, that you're doing only the modifications that you really need to accomplish. A lighter vehicle is always going to be better to drive. It's It's going to stop better. better. It's going to get better fuel economy. It's going to handle better. Um, just be considerate of where you are investing that weight. Right. Um, and I think, I think Matt and I, um, one of the things that we've benefited most from is the fact that we've traveled off of motorcycles. Yeah. Um, I didn't change my whole outlook on vehicle weight and payload and what I actually needed to bring along with me until I had a motorcycle. And until I traveled across South America on a motorcycle, I didn't have a winch with me. Yep. I, I didn't, I didn't have a recovery kit. I didn't have, I had a very small tool kit. I had essentially all of the stuff on my motorcycle could fit in the front passenger seat of the vehicle that I drive every day. I had nothing with me. And you know what? I was able to go through Peru and Colombia and Ecuador and all these other, all these other countries without a problem. You just don't need that much stuff. And I think for those that maybe are dealing with this um, stuff addiction or this too many modification addiction, take a trip in a stock vehicle or take a trip on a motorcycle. Rent a car and fly somewhere. Yeah, exactly. And, and see how it is to travel with nothing or almost nothing. I think you'll find it pretty liberating. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Stuff, stuff kind of weighs you down. It does literally (laughs) and figuratively, you know, I think comfort has a lot to do with it. Right. I mean, I, I know in, in, in our Jeep gladiator build, oh, well, we could have a, we could have hot water. Okay. Well, that's going to be, that's going to be 200 pounds between the heat exchangers, the water pumps, the custom tanks you're going to have to make, or, or you just stay in a hotel every once in a while, you know, or you bring along a little solar yeah. Shower one bag. of those Nemo yeah, Helio yeah. things, you know, there's always, there's always a, a different way of looking at it. Again, we're, we're, we're assuming that this is for a vehicle based on travel, right? I think one of the biggest, you know, kind of hit or miss things people, people get is, is suspension for sure. Right? So that, that's, that's our, that's our next commandment is it is very complex and it is so easy to mess up. Um, again, we, we, we kind of previously talked about complexity and how, you know, manufacturers spend all this time on durability testing. Well, you know, a lot of that testing is, I mean, it's related to the, to the suspension. A, a vehicle is bad if it doesn't handle good. Um, you know, so again, taking some of that, that, that OE knowledge and, and being mindful and respectful of it you know, I guess is and understanding that there's a tolerance. So a great example for this, and it's probably the best one to lead off with is an independent front suspension. Um, these, the, the amount of total travel is, cannot be changed typically without significant modifications. So there is a total amount of up travel and there's a total amount of down travel. When people lift an IFS truck, um, what they're doing is they're robbing down travel to gain up travel or, and also to gain additional ground clearance. Um, So it's really important to recognize that you're not actually improving the total suspension stroke of the vehicle. You're just robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, And that comes with real consequences. It comes with 
the ability if you if you lift it too much, you can't bring it back into alignment. And then you have toe issues and you have tire wear issues and you have camber issues as a result of that. So understanding the vehicle that you buy and what is the tolerance that it has for a suspension lift. Um, even the Arctic trucks that we, we used to cross Greenland and Antarctica, they only had a couple inches of suspension lift. The rest was accomplished by a lot of body trimming because even the Arctic truck guys recognize that once you get those CV axles at a specific angle, they fail, especially with a 44 inch tire. So understand what the limits are of your particular vehicle. And typically I have found if I keep the lift uh, between 30 and 50 millimeters, um, maybe with a Jeep Wrangler, you can get away with a little more, maybe with a full size truck, you can get away with a, a little bit more if you're on a solid axle vehicle. But I typically like around 50 millimeters of total increased lift that allows for a slightly larger tire. It allows for a little more ground clearance that makes clearing technical obstacles easier. That's what I've got on my Mercedes G-Class 50 millimeters. Everything's all within factory spec. It Do drives great. Anymore? It drives great down the road. Yeah. You know, I, man, it, it's, it's, it's a complicated thing. I mean, long travel and overlanding right now, um, whatever overlanding has become long travel is really popular. I love a good go fast truck. Um, I like going fast. It's very fun, but it has such a small place, I guess, you know, when it comes to actually traveling, I don't want to service Heim joints, you know? Uh, and also what's the, what's the rush? Yeah. Aren't, like, you, on what, 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 aren't you on vacation? What's rush? We're not saying that these things are bad. <laughs> yeah. We're not saying that they're bad products or anything, but just like, do you actually need it? I mean, if, if, if what you're trying to do is you're trying to camp and tackle really technical trails, um, I mean, that's, that's four wheeling, I guess yeah. we're, we're going to, we're going to make that call. Um, do you need the, uh, triple bypass King shocks? No. I mean, if, Hey, listen, need verse wants, I want those. I have them on my truck, but you know, I, I also recognize that when I eventually drive this thing to South America, or we're actually talking about driving across Russia. That means I have to find a place in Mongolia to rebuild my shocks. If I would have put a Bilstein 5100 or some kind of OE quality shock in there, I could invest that time into experiences. And yeah, for sure. Um, that's honestly what I would, what I would rather do. You know, the suspension is important and it is the one thing that I, I do tend to modify most often on my vehicles. I want to have enough fluid capacity in the shock absorber to be able to handle long distances of corrugation. Um, so that is something to be mindful of. It doesn't mean that you need triple bypass. It doesn't need that you need long travel, but you should be aware of the diameter of the shock itself. How much fluid capacity does it have? What's the quality of the seals? What's the diameter of the shaft? Um, how is the valving constructed? Is it, is it constructed in a way that favors a heavier load or is it constructed in a way that, which means that the rebound and compression valving is that for comfort? Um, if it is adjustable, what's the service life of that adjustable feature? Um, a lot of the adjustable features on shock absorbers get gummed up and corroded over time and then they don't work. Yeah. Like if you live in the Northeast, yeah, oh, big man, adjustable suspension would be a, it's a, it's a real problem. But I, I do like to have a little bit more fluid volume in the vehicle and that can typically be, I mean, what did you have on the expedition seven trucks? We just did old man, Emu. old man, Emu. And did yeah. you have a single failure? Not a single failure. Did you have to service it? We didn't at all. Yeah. That was yeah. There you uh, go. nearly a hundred thousand kilometers in the vehicle that I drove. Um, and the other vehicles had upwards of 70,000 kilometers as well. And this is canning stock route crossing Australia, crossing Africa, uh, driving the length of Ruta Quarenta in Argentina. These are heavily corrugated and oftentimes technical terrain. Um, and we never had a single suspension failure. But again, 50 millimeters was the suspension yeah. lift that we installed. And, and I think I think one of the biggest things people overlook is they overlook spring rate. If you're going to have a very heavy vehicle, you need a spring that can handle that. So you're not just compensating with a big shock, right? right. I see a lot of people do that. Um, you know, these days they... They, I mean, a, a, a big King shock is a beautiful thing and it can mask a lot of, you know, other shortcomings. Um, but yeah, make, make sure that you're actually getting the right, um, the right spring rate. Right. I mean, I think that's something that old man Emu does, does really well is they, they have do a good job. They have they give several you options, yeah. options. I mean, on my Land Cruiser, I had six or seven different, um, different options. I, I don't know if I necessarily see people considering that these days. Maybe they just don't have the options. 
Um, cause there's really, I guess, nothing legally in the U S that says you have to accommodate. There um, isn't, but I, the, I think it is, things, I but. think it is important. Um, and then recognizing that as we lift the vehicle, it changes so many other things. It changes the roll center. It changes the center of gravity. Um, it changes the way that the vehicle dynamics work on the whole, because you've now changed the angles of the drag links. You've changed the angles of the radius arms and all of that can start adding um, additional issues like vibra- uh, especially on an 80 series, you can get front front drive shaft vibrations yep. um, that start to become a factor as well. Um, so just being aware of the fact that there's a very small tolerance actually that you can lift or modify a vehicle uh, before it starts to have a bunch of other negative effects. So Consider a lift if you need it for the terrain that you travel. I do like to travel on technical routes um, and about a one and a half inch lift is all I've really needed for anything I've ever done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, again, guys invest in, invest in yourself, right? Get, get, get trained by a, a qualified certified four wheel drive trainer. Um, you would be amazed at the, uh, the places you can take a completely stock truck. I mean, that's one of my favorite things to do is to go to Moab, you know, get a manufacturer to give me some kind of completely stock vehicle. And yeah, you know, it's great. You, you, you drive a Range Rover, you know, up the waterfall and poison spider next to a guy that just spent like 20 grand modifying his JK. So he could walk up it easier. And it's just that, that very smug smile that you can give. Totally. It's, it's quite nice. or, or even the Rubicon trail. I remember it was probably 2007 and I was um, working for Jeep and I was testing the new Liberty of uh, the square, more square shape, Liberty. And they wanted me to take the Liberty across the Rubicon. And I'm like, all right. And they're like, it's stock. Um, sure I said, is, there, is there any way that we can put some like factory sliders on the thing? And they're like, yeah, we'll send those. And of course they didn't send the sliders, but I'd still, I still remember driving into Rubicon Springs in a bone stock Jeep yeah. Liberty that had just done the same trail as everybody else. Um, and it's not because I'm some four wheel drive guru. That's not the point. The point is, is that the vehicle, it's, these vehicles are extremely capable. And if you drive slowly and you get a spotter and you gain some skills through additional training, uh, it's amazing where a stock vehicle would go. And there's a lot of fun in driving yeah. a stock vehicle. It's a chess game. I mean, that's is. one of the things you taught me a long time ago. I mean, and, and you're talking about a spotter. If, if you have a partner that you travel with, I mean, whomever is driving or spotting or vice versa. I mean, I know with Laura and I, you know, half of the gnarly photos I have of my trucks, she's the one driving, right? Uh, make sure that everybody in the vehicle knows how to spot, that everybody knows how to drive because I, I will take a, a stock or poorly modified vehicle and a great spotter over a bad spotter and a, you know, a JK on 40s or something, right? I mean, Absolutely. you know, we, we were just on the Rubicon in stock gladiators with the Jeep team maybe a month or two ago now. and. um yeah, it's it's an interesting perspective to do a trail in a stock vehicle and then to get off the trail and you have keyboard warriors telling you that your 37s aren't enough. And I'm like, yeah. you guys are going down like the Mojave Road. It's fun. like you're 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 going to Alabama Hills and posing for photos like you don't need any of this stuff. You don't. Again, tell me you want it and I'm not going to say anything, but tell me you need something and there's probably a reason you don't. Yeah. So, oh, there's always going to be a reason you don't. Yeah. Cuz there's always someone who's done it. Yep. in a way less capable vehicle. Yeah. I don't know. I, that, that, that gets me off more than the check writing does. So, yeah. And, and I mean, how many times have we been in some remote place in Africa where you think you're totally hardcore, you're in low range in your G wagon. And, and then here comes a, a bunch of locals pushing a, a Toyota Tercel up the, up the hill. I, I, I drove the, the majority went up. of the Perry Dakar course in Morocco in a rented Dacia Logan. There you go. That's like a check designed Moroccan built Toyota Corolla. It yeah. wasn't that good, but it did it. And I had the experience. And uh, if I spent the entire time, you know, trying to modify trucks or save up enough money to have this, have this, this item to go do this thing, eh, just, just go do it. Yeah. But just go do it. Yeah. Keeping the engine stock. All right. Yeah. So we're at number four on the list and this one tends to be the most contentious because people love horsepower. Um, in fact, there's a couple things that we've recognized through the years that people love. People love power. They love things that transform like a roof tent. They love that. 
Um, they, and because it's also like a tree fort at the same time. Oh so yeah, it's, yeah. It's pretty amazing. The things that are like harken right back to our childhood. <laughs> like what I really want is a tree fort on my vehicle. <laughs> it's pretty funny, but I, the, but I'm keeping, failing to see the problem. Yeah. Keeping the vehicle stock is really, is really key. Um, it doesn't mean don't change anything. Like, so for example, uh, famous motorcycle, Kawasaki KLR 650, uh, probably one of the most commonly used motorcycles to ride around the world. Um, and there is an issue with the engine that needs to be addressed. It's called the doohickey mod. Um, you go in there, you remove this factory plastic a uh, chain tensioner and you replace it with something more robust and then you never need to replace it yep. again. Um, so it doesn't mean that there aren't things that need to be modified on your motor potentially. Um, but it's really important that you do it in only when absolutely necessary. If someone says, "Ah, oh, my vehicle's underpowered, it usually means your vehicle is overloaded. Or if you say your or or vehicle, geared. your vehicle is underpowered, it may need to have a gearing change or you just bought the wrong car for the application that you need. If you live in Leadville, Colorado, you need a specific kind of vehicle. You want something with forced induction. That's right. You want Trust you, me. Yeah, you want a supercharger, you want a turbocharger, you want something that addresses an environmental consideration, uh, but for the most part, uh, keeping the engine stock is critical because if you need to get it serviced somewhere, um, the only chance you've got, um, if you got that triple bypass, super ECU with a double turbocharger, like how in the world do you get that fixed in the middle of nowhere? The answer is you don't. Yeah. Right. Now you've done a couple things to your 80. Ta- tell me about what you Yeah. Did. So, you know, I wanted to do some things, right? Um, so Land Cruiser 1HDT engine that's in my my 80 um, factory fitted. Um, I want to say from the factory, it ran six to eight pounds of boost. Very, very modest. Now that motor would run forever and ever on that. But the same block, the same head, um, and, and you know, there's probably a few small changes in a Yanmar marine diesel engine, for example. Um, that same engine runs at 24 PSI constant, right? Like marine engines run at a certain RPM. That's what they're designed for. That's great. So I ended up, you know, looking to Australia where they've, you know, they, they have data of, of, you know, thousands of these things being sold. And I put a, an aftermarket turbocharger on it. Now it's the same style of turbo, the same size of turbo that, that it came with. I want to say it's a CT 26 Toyota turbo. Um, but when that engine was designed in the late eighties as a, something that came out in, you know, very, very early nineties, the technologies available to them are drastically different than the ones that were available today. So we're talking, it has a different, you know, as a billet spinny fidget wheel in the middle that supposedly creates more boost. Um, and we ended up doing a, a, a top mount intercooler um, from a company called HPD as well. Um, you know, it was actually, it wasn't just made in a factory in China or something. It was made in Australia. It's very good, very good intercooler. And that turbo is from, from G turbo. And that, that transformed the vehicle. Now I, I walked into that knowing this, this is probably going, not probably, this is going to, you know, decrease the longevity of this engine. But I went through things like bottom end bearings. I made sure that the valves were in spec. Um, I made sure to replace all the seals. I, I replaced all of the all the associated seals on the intake. Cause I knew I'd be running a higher boost. You know, if you have a, you have a balloon that's only used to being blown up so much over time. And then you put an extra 10 pounds of pressure in it. Maybe it pops. Um, so, you know, keep it stock. Um, make sure it's serviceable, I guess is the big yeah, thing. I think that's right? the key really. Cause that, if you did have that turbo go out on you in South Africa, you could go to a Toyota dealership and order a replacement I could, stock it, it turbo. It could just drop right in, right? And you could drop My right intercooler in. requ- had no modifications to the vehicle. I took over the cross, took off the crossover pipe, put this thing on. I have the parts sitting at home. You know, it, it's, it's easy. It's great. And an intercooler is, it's not a mechanical device. I mean, it's just. Yeah, it was a holistic thing. I mean, I could have not put the intercooler on that particular vehicle, but then my intake temperatures would be higher. My exhaust gas temperatures were higher. For sure. You just have to know what you're doing. Um, you know, I mean, and, and there's exceptions to the rule five, five, 10 years ago, if somebody said, Oh, I'm going to do a cold air intake. I'm like, well, why you're going to have this obscure filter that you can't service. And while I do not have cold air intakes on any of my stuff, there's some interesting companies coming out with stuff now. Like I want to say S and B intakes, 
Um, there's a few others that do a fully sealed, you know, pulls from the factory location, but maybe is increasing the filtration element. I, I think some of those things are okay. Yeah, I think they, um, I think they can be fine. You just want to be able to service them in the middle of nowhere when you're when you're in Inner Mongolia and you need to order a part that yeah. it isn't that the turbo company's like, oh man, we don't have any of these on the sh- on the shelf. Yeah. Or they send you the wrong one because they use a different one the next year. Um, I think the 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 key is serviceability and reliability. If if the modification is not likely to affect reliability, it's probably worth considering. Can you service it in the field? Can you do you know which parts to order, or can you use factory parts in its stead? Then I think that that's fine. I, again, none of these things are are hard and fast rules, but. We, in general, we want to be really careful modifying the motor. Yeah. I mean, like I would be very hesitant um, on an international vehicle to say, put a aftermarket supercharger or an aftermarket turbocharger on there. If the vehicle wasn't designed for it, like I, on, on my gladiator, I, uh, I struggle with that one because that car needs another 50 or 60 horsepower after it's been built. But I also realize that maybe that all of a sudden becomes more of a four wheel four wheeling yeah. vehicle. Right. Um, or you decide to keep it in North America where you've got cell coverage and you can get things yeah, fixed. Yeah, exactly. Now you, you did change the gearing though. Did that fix most of the problem? Yeah. I just came from a Ford Raptor and want more power. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest here. Yeah. No, the, the gearing and the cool thing with the gearing is that I was able to use fact, well, as close to factors you can get. So Dana Spicer, who obviously makes the Dana axles that are underneath it. You know, they had four eighty eights off the shelf. I mean, quite literally same gear, different ratio, same testing process, the same manufacturing, same line. Um, I, I, I try to look for that kind of stuff. I think Um, that's a good idea. You know, companies that have good warranties, companies that have a strong reputation, do some research on the products that you're looking to purchase. Uh, What are other people talking about? There's plenty of groups on Facebook You can hop on the forums on various sites. Huge resource. I mean, obviously exhibition portal, um, but you know, then the, the vehicle specific forums and, and groups are, yeah, that makes, that makes a huge difference in making sure that you're not diving into an issue. Uh, what, what do we got for number five here, Matt? We got, uh, isolate and minimize all electrical modifications. Yeah. I, I think the things that actually scare me most on, on when I'm shooting a custom vehicle feature or just shooting the breeze with somebody at a trade show is the inevitable bird's nest of wiring um, that that takes place. There's there's like zero excuse for bad wiring in what are we 2019? Right. right? We have S Pod, we have Switch Pro, we have companies like Ford and Jeep that are building in you know device switch management at, at a factory level. Again, on my Gladiator, um, I, I can choose from four switches. And I can go into the, the the screen and say, do I want to do a momentary switch? Do I want it to be a latching switch? Do I want it to be, you know, selectable even if the vehicle's off, right? Um, this is this is easy, right? This yeah. is this is the easy thing in 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 in, in, in today's world. Um, watch that wiring. I mean, yeah, and the biggest how one, many vehicles yeah. have you seen burned down? Oh yeah, I mean, we've seen videos on YouTube recently of vehicles catching on fire because yeah of of improper wiring. Um, one of the things that people make the most common mistake of is that they don't fuse the right end of a wire. Yeah. So they'll be, they'll connect it to the battery and then it'll run 10 feet along the frame and then it'll have a fuse by the compressor. That's too late, man. It's, there's no fuse. You want the fuse at the power source. So that way, if, um, that wiring, if the insulation gets chafed through and it starts to arc against the frame, um, that it doesn't catch on fire, melt and catch the whole vehicle on fire, that the fuse blows at the power source, which is the battery. Yeah. Um, so it's, and it's also important to isolate um, the house systems. Now, when I say house systems, that's anything that you've added after the vehicle is stock. So that's, that's going to be solar panel, dual battery systems. It's going to be GPS units. It's going to be um, subwoofers, any of the stuff that you add after the fact, water pumps, all of that should be isolated 
to the house system. So that the way the stock vehicle wiring and the stock battery, the starting power is completely isolated and not affected by those other sources. And you need to be able to disconnect the two. So if you have problems with the house systems, uh, you can just either with a mechanical switch or with a dual battery system with a disconnectable switch, you, you need to be able to isolate those two so you can always preserve starting power. Um, so I think fusing is really critical. Making sure that you isolate the house systems are really critical. And I think the last thing that's often overlooked is plan this stuff out from the beginning. It doesn't mean that you need to buy everything right off the bat, but plan it out from the beginning. Yeah. Sit down with somebody who's knowledgeable about vehicle wiring and think about all of the systems that you want to might want to put on the vehicle and plan from that from the very start. So that way you have the right number of positions on a fuse block. Yep. So that way you have, uh, when you run wiring through the firewall, that you do it all at the same time. Even if that wire is not connected to the fuse block, and it's terminated in um, in some type of insulation, but run all of that wiring at the at the start so that way you're not putting wiring on top of wiring on top of wiring. It's all loomed properly. It's all protected properly, isolated from hot sources like the exhaust or a turbo um, in the engine compartment. It's shocking the amount of wires that I see just laying on top of an engine um, in people's uh, aftermarket installations. So plan that stuff from the very beginning. um, So that way, when you, when your systems grow and they become um, slightly more complex um, that you've already considered that from the start. Yeah. Yeah. Again, on on our most recent build, for example, and I was lucky with the Land Cruiser actually came with a factory dual battery system. So all I had to do was add a, you know, add a solenoid that disconnected those two at a at a, at a certain voltage. Um, with the Gladiator, I ran one single, I want to say it was a four, about a four gauge or eight gauge wire, ran that all the way back to the AT Summit that's on the back. It immediately got a, I I ended up not fusing it. I ended up going with a high amperage circuit breaker. Um, Now, what I really like about that, and I want to say that's from Blue Sea Systems, who also made the fuse block. um, If the vehicle's sitting for a while, right, I know that all of my factory wiring is fine, right? Again, companies spend a lot of time on this. They don't want vehicles burning down. I literally press a button and the entire, you know, that house system is is isolated right um and doesn't have any any drain in the battery it, it's easy it, it's also a nice way to reset things um yeah just spend time on wiring yeah Make it's, sure really, stuff, it's really it's yeah. really critical and i and i think that it's probably the source of greatest frustration for most overlanders when it comes from modifications i see people fiddling with electronics all the time nine out of ten times it's that they're their GPS isn't getting power or their iPhone can't charge or, um, you know, their, their auxiliary lights won't turn on. It's 90% of the time it's something related to electronics. And that's usually because, um, 12 volt seems like a black art and people just kind of throw it in their vehicle. Yeah. Um, and it, it does take time and some thought. And they don't realize, I mean, they, it's, it's actually really simple, right? You you just want to, you want to wire the most amount of stuff with the most, with, with the fewest amount of appropriate connections, right? right. right. Um, keep it simple, go from there. So, and then make sure you have a wiring schematic that you prepare at the same time and keep it in the vehicle, take a picture of it with your phone. So you've also got a digital copy of it so that you know what color wire this is that goes here and does this. That way, if you need to isolate that, or you need to trace it back, you can actually do that. So create a wiring schematic at the same time, get, talk to a friend that's an engineer or somebody who knows how to do that and they'll help you. But it's really important that you've got that and that you keep a record of it with you in the vehicle. Yeah. And, and just one last thing on that, make sure, you know, your, your, your fuse block is accessible. You know, that was something I was really impressed. I, I, when I was doing the gladiator camper, I'd intended to just kind of bury my fuse block somewhere back and when I picked up the truck, AT Overland had actually like built a bracket and everything for my fuse block. And all I have to do is pull off this panel with no tools and I can visually see every fuse, every wiring connection. It's so like, it's, it's really nice, but I don't have any wiring issues. And if I do, it's very easily fixed. Yeah, yeah that makes a huge difference. Okay. So we're on to, everybody loves tires. 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 Yes. Tires. We got number six on our list. 
Use high quality tires with an appropriate tread pattern. So let's just adjure, address the uh, the elephant in the room, mud terrain tires. You I know. mean, they look great on a vehicle. They really do. And I think that that's why people buy them 99% of the time is because they look the part. Yeah. And, you know, Huge some people make the argument like, oh, well, I'd rather have more traction than less traction. Some people say it's like a race car. You want the stickiest tire possible. And I, I don't know if I agree with that, especially for travelers, right? Well, um, and a mud tire doesn't work better in Moab than an all-terrain. A mud tire does not work better than an all-terrain in yeah. sand. It does not work better. Um, there's every terrain has a different requirement and mud tires are designed to work in mud. They're designed to have a, a high void rate so that they can evacuate the mud as the wheels spin. Um, which means that that high void rate means you have less rubber on yeah. the terrain in Moab. And you also have less rubber on the terrain uh, when you're on the asphalt, when you're trying to stop in wet conditions, mud tires typically don't have siping as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that affects ice performance in addition. So uh, mud tires, they really are like the glam solution, but most of the time you don't need them. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if you live in, you know, the East coast as a pair, you know, as compared to where we live in the, in the Southwest, I, I, I get the argument totally for a mud tire. Oh yeah. If you're, I mean, if you live in a muddy environment, if you live in Alaska, yeah. you're going to have mud tires. You, Absolutely. You, if you want to go anywhere, you, you need them. Um, you know, for, for people that are traveling and for people that don't live in muddy areas, I, 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 I don't, I mean, I haven't owned a set of mud tires since I left miserable muddy places. Um, that's Illinois, but some of these new all-terrain tires, like I, I'm a big They're fan really of the good. Falcon wild peaks. That's um, I guess what, what came on the gladiator stock. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're, they're quiet. They're snowflake rated. I think that's a big thing. That's a big thing for me. Um, you know, having recently moved from Colorado, there's a lot of times where the passes are restricted. If you don't have, you don't have winter tires, um, Oregon, Oregon and Washington, a lot of those places, and you are not going to find a snowflake rated mud terrain tire. I mean, they are super sketchy in the winter. Um, I, I remember, remember that the Trek discovery oh, yeah. that Land Rover lent us for, for quite a while. I remember having that thing slightly off camber and, you know, typical rain slush base with snow on top. And man, you, you had like see-through on that tire, which I'm sure was great for, for mud. Um, but in the snow, oh my God, that was yeah, it just it's, <laughs> it's not a fun experience sideways, to be yeah, in. Um, you know, you, you want durability, I think, is the biggest thing. I mean, I guess that that iconic um, Overland tire that you see on Defenders and, and whatever is the Michelin XZL. Right. right? Yeah, it's um, right behind us on the Defender right there. Behind us on the Defender. Five feet from Matt right now. Very durable tire, but a horrible tire. They are. They are. <laughs> I mean, the first time I did a wet a wet traction stop with those things. Um, I, I saw my life flash before my eyes. They, they do not work in wet conditions. They, they do not work in ice. Uh, they barely work in snow. It needs to be powdery, yep. loose snow. Uh, they work great in mud and they also hardly ever, if ever get punctures. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but um, I run those tires on the, on this vehicle because they're the appropriate tire for that. Yeah, vehicle. They, look, so, they look right. Yeah. It's just, it's just a you're, great, you're not buying a defender for no. driving dynamics. No, you're not. You know, the, you're not the little bit of noise you pick up from the tire is yeah. thrown out the window. Um, yeah, I think it's important to remember that a modern all terrain is a very different tire from 20 years ago. They have so much more technology in them. They, they typically have siping, so they work much better in wet conditions. They also, you can buy some all terrains with a higher void rate. Uh, they call them oftentimes hybrid tires now. Um, so if you look at like a Dura track, for example, these yeah. are a hybrid mud tire all terrain. Um, if you need something with a little bit higher void rate, because you do tend to, to operate in, in wet or muddy conditions, you may want to consider one of those. Uh, but an all terrain will always give you longer tread life. It will also give you better performance on dry rock. It will give you better performance in the sand. Um, you're going to end up with much better stopping distances. It'll be a lot safer tire overall. For the traveler. So we tend to recommend that people look at uh, an all terrain BF Goodrich K KO3, yeah. um, great tire. Cooper makes some great tires. Continental just came out with some really great yeah. all terrains that I'm running on the Mercedes. Yeah, the terrain a, contact. Yeah, there's some really great tires. Super out cool there now. looking tire. Yeah. You know, I again, the all terrain tires are going to last longer too. Um, if you 
you know, if you're, if you're driving to parts unknown, how many times do you really want to change your tires? And yeah. the, and the, and the thing on top of that is tire size is super important for overland vehicles. You know, guess who doesn't have 37s in stock? Yeah. Most of the world, <laughs> most of the world. Yeah. Guess who doesn't have 35s in stock? Yeah. Most of the world. Guess who doesn't have obscure tire sizes, uh, you know, that allowed you to have the largest tire on your particular vehicle, maybe due to brake setup and needing to run a larger wheel. Probably not in stock, right? Stick to a available tire size because you're, you can't predict that, right? Yeah. I mean, we can sit here and say, I mean, it's kind of, what, I don't think either of us really have regular tire failures. No, no. I mean, I can't, I mean, I, I had my first flat on a trip uh, just last year in Australia. Yeah. I, 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 I've had one flat and I took my mom for a little drive in her Lexus GX when she was visiting in Colorado where we used to live and got a flat tire on one of her Michelins and I had to change a tire. Like yeah. that was, that was it. But you yeah, modern tires are really good. You can't rely on that, right? Because you could be in Guatemala and you're driving through a roadblock or something where they just burned a bunch of pallets and you run over a yeah, few totally. nails or you, you can't predict that. So you always want something that's appropriate size that can be replaced. Um, appropriate tread pattern. If you're in Guatemala. Yeah, in most of the world, you're looking at a 16 inch diameter wheel, all of Africa, all of Australia, Europe, you're going to find 16 inch wheels. Uh, it is starting to become more common to find 17s in various places, uh, but they tend to not be the larger diameter tires. So even in the middle of Mexico, you can find a 255, 65, 16 tire, which is nearly a 32 inch tall tire. You can find those all over the place because that's what a lot of the GM vehicles came with stock. Yeah. Um, so just making sure that you, you're not getting a super obscure wheel, super obscure tire. Um, or if you do make sure you plan in advance, um, and have tires available for you in a country in the future. Don't, don't get into Argentina and be like, you know, I should probably change my tires and expect something to happen quickly. Um, you may need to order those well in advance. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. Now, now this is another elephant in the room for sure. Uh, so this is number seven avoid roof loads. Um, this one gets the most reactions out of anything other than the motor, the motor changes. Uh, and that's because people want to put stuff on the top of their car. It's like this giant canvas that invites, or like a magnet that invites mm -hmm. fuel cans, max tracks, roof tents, um, any numerous, uh, innumerable amount of things. I mean, all the, why, why is all the recovery kit on the top? On Why the top the heaviest of the stuff in yeah. the worst place. Uh, and, and that's because it, it seems like it's not only a place to, to, to flash some cool gear, but it also seems like a really convenient spot to stick things that you don't typically use. Um, that those heavy items do not belong on the roof. Most vehicles have a roof load maximum rating of around 120 to 140 pounds, which is literally just a roof tent. Yep. or just a rack and a couple minor accessories like a, like an awning, et cetera. It isn't until you get into vehicles like the 200 series that you f actually find a 200 plus pound payload for the roof. Uh, and then the new defender as a 360 yeah, really pound. significant. I mean, they, they designed that with a roof tent in mind, they which, did. Is, which is really cool. Really yeah. Cool. And that's, and that's the, that's the highest roof load rating I've ever seen for a standard SUV. Um, but it, it, think of just basic physics. Once you start to add that, that stuff on a vehicle that's lifted already um, and you add 200 pounds to the roof, uh, you've significantly impacted center of gravity. You've significantly Im impacted performance on the trail. If you need to do an emergency lane change at speed, um, all of those things, it's going to come back to bite you. Um, and it, then it also affects fuel economy. It affects wind noise. All of those things um, are going to be impacted by that heavy roof load. So what I like to recommend is put a rack up there. Absolutely. Maybe put a roof tent if you really like sleeping in roof tents. Uh, but other than that, keep the, the roof empty. I like a rack because you may need to move equipment from another vehicle. You may have a, another a vehicle in your party that breaks down and you've got to move some equipment of your own vehicle up top and from theirs up top in order to get people out in order to get uh, the folks out. But for the most part, go with an empty roof rack. It'll do you a good service. Yeah, I I have to think that that's great advice too. I mean, I I've gone through several iterations of this where I put a lot of a lot of junk on top, and I've just found like I mean, like wh why people put high lift jacks on on their roof racks, I have no idea. Um, you know, that's eighty pounds in the worst absolute 
absolute place that you could put it. Um, you know, what, what I use roof racks for the most and why I completely agree, have an empty roof rack, firewood. Yeah. Like, put sick firewood. like you don't want to put firewood inside your vehicle. You're talking bugs, you're talking grime, whatever you do, who cares? But I don't know when I'm, when I'm camping in the middle of nowhere, I often find that firewood doesn't come in, um, you know, neatly cut predetermined size bundles. Sometimes you have long sticks, sometimes you have big logs, whatever, throw it up there. You're done. Um, move on. Yeah. Not a popular opinion. Um, yeah, also great for solar and yeah. awnings. I mean, that's all I have in mind is solar and an awning. I think, I think roof racks, they have their place. I like to, I like to sleep up there every once in a while. I mean, if it's a beautiful weather and I don't want to set up a tent, I'll just sleep up on top of the rack. Uh, I've definitely run roof tents on vehicles that have the payload capacity for it uh, because of convenience. Sometimes um, I do, I do use roof tents on occasion, but I always make sure that I'm under that 140, 150 pound uh, total weight capacity. Cause it really does uh, have an impact. Yeah. Uh, now that we've talked about roof, roof loads, basically just avoid them. Um, think long and hard before you put anything on the top of the vehicle. Yeah. And definitely stick to one of the, the new modern roof racks, right? I mean, front runner, easy on, yeah, light aluminum, rack, lightweight, very, extruded aluminum, very lightweight, very easy to, you know, to attach accessories to when you need them. I always keep a few eye bolts on my Rhino rack roof rack, for example. Um, so you can just tie stuff down. Yeah, it's easy. So, and, and it's a good place to stick something like Max Tracks, where you want to be able to get yeah, access yeah. to them. Um, which brings us to number eight, self recovery. So, um, one of the things that is a reality of keeping our vehicles near stock or more stock and less modified is there's a chance we're going to get stuck more often. Definitely. Which I actually think is a bonus. I enjoy it when I get stuck. I actually it makes for great stories. I hate it, but then I enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. And you learn something new every time you learn something about the people you travel with. Um, you end up with some great memories to share decades later. Um, and so self-recovery is something that we actually have to plan for with our vehicle modifications. Uh, that could be a 12 volt vehicle mounted winch. Um, it could be, um, a high lift with a recovery kit. Um, if you have a very unlikely event of having to get um, recovered. Um, you know, you can use a tear first style winch with, which is another hand hand winch. Um, but most, for the most part, you want to start off with, do I have a good shovel? Do I have a good recovery strap? And then typically I recommend traction boards at that point. Um, and just in full disclosure to the audience, uh, Matt does import the max tracks and sells the max tracks. I happen to use them and I've used them for a lot longer than Matt's been selling them. Um, but it is important for us just to disclose that. But uh, traction boards, especially from a quality manufacturer, what you should be looking for, um, because they perform a lot of service when it comes to recovery. The vast majority of my recoveries that I've completed in recent years has been easily solved with a set of traction boards. Yeah. I mean, you know, traction boards... They make everything easier. And, you know, I guess it's a, a bit of a challenge because everybody thinks I'm going to be selling something. But I, I honestly, I haven't been in a situation, whether I'm winching, using a snatch strap, um, whatever kind of, you know, extrication of vehicle where, where Max Trucks haven't made that a little bit easier, right? I mean, it does. What, yeah. All you're trying to do when you're getting a vehicle unstuck, right? You're trying to free stiction. You know, stiction is like as a kid when you put a glass underwater and you fill it up with water and you turn it upside down and try and get it out, right? It doesn't want to come out, right? The same thing is happening to your vehicle underneath. It's just mud or water or sand. You have all these different surfaces that are kind of keying together to prevent your vehicle from moving forward. And, um, you know, sometimes attraction reports are really simple. They just, they give you enough traction to lift your vehicle up, which is the key thing that breaks that stiction and then forward. Um, and, and there's a couple of things I like about them. I can, I can remove them from the vehicle and, put them in a different vehicle. Yep. If I come across a vehicle that's stuck and I don't want to drive closer because I'm going to get stuck, mm -hmm. I can take the traction boards off and I can walk to that stuck vehicle. I can help um, others. Like if, if I'm feeling a little sketched out about who's stuck, like maybe these people are going to sue me if I try to pull them out yeah. with my winch, I can be like, Hey, I've got these things. Um, you might want to use those. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and it kind of removes some of that liability as well. Um, I do find that they, they provide a lot of support, even in very difficult stuck situations where it requires a 12 volt winch. Um, that could be building a road underneath. I remember being stuck for 12 hours in Australia in the middle of the canning stock. Um, and we used 12 
traction boards to get out. We literally built a road of max tracks underneath the vehicles yep. uh, to get out. And that's because we broke winch lines. We broke winches. Um, we were down to one functioning winch uh, and 12 max tracks. And that's how we actually eventually got all of the vehicles out. Um, but it's, I think we have to start with anything vehicle related, vehicle recovery related requires training. Um, now re- training is not something you have to necessarily pay for. Find your local club, find yeah. another overlander with a lot of experience, um, somebody that you trust and have them start to teach you those skills. Um, vehicle recovery is very dangerous. There's a lot of components to it um, that have high energy. Um, it can be the 9,000 pounds that that winch can pull, um, or it can be significantly more than that if you're doing a vehicle to vehicle recovery using a, a kinetic energy recovery strap um, so or a recovery rope. Um, All of those things have a lot of energy and dynamics to them and they require training. So again, we talked about this in the beginning, but make sure that you seek out a great trainer, International Four Wheel Drive Trainers Association, um, guys like Bill Burke, uh, people like um, Overland Experts. Bob Wollers is in Southern California. He's great. Bob's another great one. Make sure that you get some training uh, with these devices before you go out in the field. Because remember, we're trying to make the vehicles light and simple, which means that they're not always going to have all of the gadgets that makes it less likely that you get stuck. So if you have the stuff that you need in order to get a recovery done properly and you have the training for it, that's usually all you need. Yeah. And if you don't have the training for it, just stop. Honestly, yeah. I mean, if you're stuck in sand or mud or, or whatever, what, what's the worst that can happen if you just walk away? I, 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 always, I always stress that to people that, that I talk to is let your heart rate come down. People yeah. get very, very stressed in, in, in recovery scenarios and it leads to they it feel leads, embarrassed or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's and they whether it's yeah, ego or, or whatever, just like chill out, like take a second to breathe, calm down and evaluate the situation. Yeah. For you sure. know, um, and, and use common sense, come up with so. a plan, talk about the plan with the people that you're with. Um, make sure that the non-essential personnel are outside of the recovery area so they don't get injured. Yeah. And, and, and don't put a, don't put a snatch strap or a dynamic strap on anything that isn't rated. That's if you right. don't, if you don't know what's going on, um, don't do it. Cause then, then nothing worse can happen. Right. Um, I always stress to people never, ever, ever, ever put a, uh, a dynamic snatch strap on a, on a, on a tow ball. I mean, yeah. that is a, turns into a cannonball. People die from that every yeah. year. I always, whenever we're talking about this stuff, I always bring that up. It's something I, I feel pretty personally strong on. So yeah, a tow ball re- is used for towing, yep. towing a trailer. Uh, yep. It's not used for anything else. Pull that draw bar out of the two inch receiver. Um, if that's all you've got, pull that out, slide the strap in there and then put um, a cross pin in there for the recovery. That's still not necessarily ideal, but it is a lot safer than looping a strap over a tow ball, over a cannonball and putting 8,000 pounds of force behind yeah, it. Yeah. Not a good idea. So, all right. Yeah, well, so securing yeah, on, the load. Yeah, we're on number nine, securing the load. So this isn't really a modification, but it is something that requires mindset. Um, we often see this in the field is that people just, especially after they've been traveling for a while, yeah. the back of their vehicle becomes an explosion. Oh yeah, um, yeah. And it becomes, and that explosion of stuff that's not secured, that's just thrown in the back of a vehicle can become a projectile if you get into an accident. Hundred um, percent, and it can also lead to a lot of frustration. It can lead to unnecessary damage to the vehicle, to the interior of the vehicle. It can damage uh, critical pieces of equipment that you've brought along with you, like your camera, for example. When that Pelican case falls on your camera and breaks breaks the lens off the lens mount, um, all of those things. Again, Matt and I have learned a lot of these things the hard way. Um, making sure that you secure your load properly, which means you have to have rated lashing points within your vehicle. Um, if they don't have that, make sure you add them. Um, make sure that you don't have stuff um, just loose. Um, once you get into yeah. an accident, these are major projectiles. I, I, I find that there's two, there's two major, you know, violators of this. One is you just said cameras. I mean, I, I have literally had cameras fly into my windshield. Um, that, that would hurt if you all of a sudden were doing 70 mile an hour and stopped. Right. And also I, people, for some reason, throw like these bow shackles, D ring shackles, you know, in little stretchy pockets that are in, yeah. the, in, in, in their back seat or, um, you know, somewhere that's not, that doesn't contain that. I mean, that is, that becomes a missile 
I mean, I've seen photos and I've talked to people that have had that stuff go through windshields. Sure. Right. Um, you want to make sure that even the smallest things that you, you just have a plan, right? I mean, how, how bad would you feel if, you know, you're, you're just trying to avoid somebody pulls out in front of you and you're trying to avoid an accident and you know, your drawer system becomes unhinged and traps a kid in the back seat or, or, or something, right? Like you, you have to have thought with these modifications. Yeah. We, again, as travelers, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility for the people that are with us. So um, if you've got your loved one with you and they ha- they don't know how all this stuff necessarily works and you haven't tied things down and they get injured, that's on us. It's our responsibility to be mindful of that. Um, and also those things are that are loose, they can end up trapped underneath the brake pedal. They can end up trapped underneath the accelerator. Um, they can disrupt the driver while they're driving. Um, so it's just keep this stuff secured properly. Um, and it'll also make for a more comfortable and relaxed trip for everybody. And, th- and this leads us to number 10. It's our last talking point. Yeah. I call it the buy once cry once mentality. Yeah, that's right. You know, so quality and design over quantity. Um, man, where do you start with that one? Um, I, it's something that I've, I've lived my entire life by, right? I mean, I, I'm not saying I just go out and automatically buy the most expensive thing. There's a lot of cases where the most expensive thing is not the best thing, right? Um, do your research, um, and, and figure out not only what works for you, but what's actually going to, what's, what's going to last. Right. Um, I see, I see this as a, very dangerous thing in overlanding right now. I feel overlanding five years ago had a really strong sense of buy once, cry once, right? You, you, you had a group of people that, um, were actually using the stuff and actually traveling and, and, and they had, they really saw no other choice. Like they couldn't afford to buy something two or three times. And I think these days you're, you know, man, I see it on Instagram all the time and I'm not trying to vilify Instagram or influence. I have a lot of really dear friends that are you know, I, at least I call them influencers. Scott, you're probably an influencer. No, I hope not. Oh, oh God. <laughs> um, so no, but, but what I'm getting at is sometimes people do things just to have the look right. Um, so then I pay attention to like these chintzy plastic Chinese recovery boards, right? They, they break the first time you use them or, or they fade or they bake in the UV. Why you put into that on there? Um, you know, LED light bars, right? Yeah, you can get them for twenty dollars from China now. Um, I, I I think they're quite useful um, if you're stuck in the Sahara Desert and you're trying to use them to collect moisture to, in a survival situation because they're yeah. they're horrible. Um, you know, they, they they blind the the person that's sitting behind them more so than anything. You know, do do your research and 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 if you're on a budget, the odds are you you probably you don't need a lot of this stuff to travel. Um, you know, if if somebody can do it on a motorcycle without the refrigerator, without the roof rock without the tent, without all this stuff, you, you can do it in a car. Yeah, right? Think about Ted Simon traveled around the world for 10 years off of the same motorcycle he left with. Yeah. And most of the bags and panniers he had, you couldn't buy them from Turatech at the time. He built them himself. Yep. Um, so it's just, it's just really important to, to acknowledge that if we're going to buy something, it should be extremely high quality and we should be intentional about it. And we should only buy like one thing at a time. Be incremental in your purchases. Um, just going in with a credit card into the local four drive shop and saying, "Hey, build me an overland vehicle." That's probably the worst way. Yeah, to you go can about do that it. at four wheel parts now, and they're going to throw a variety of stuff they've rebranded from from Alibaba. And I'm not going to say that it's going to fail, but like, a lot of times those things do fail. And yeah, they, they result in disappointment. And if you think about a North American overlander, we we're lucky if we have two weeks off a year. Yeah. So if we're on our one two week trip down to Baja and half of the stuff that we bought that's cheap or that's um, not reliable or that's not durable fails. It takes away from that experience and they end up in the garbage bin and maybe we could have gone three weeks if we hadn't bought any of it. Yeah. Um, So I think, I think to summarize and it really brings it all back to um, modify as minimal as possible Uh, be very intentional about the things that you do change. Um, if you can do a bunch of trips without doing any modifications at all yeah. and find out what you actually need, what you really need. If you're worried about getting stuck or breaking down, go with others, go with other people and they can help you out. Um, if you have trouble, um, but you, a, a stock Tacoma could go around the world three times without any modifications, um, throw a backpack into the back seat and off you go and spend that 30 or $40,000 that people will spend on their trucks to actually go see the world. You could travel the world 
for 40 grand. You could, yeah, you could, that would include all of your shipping. It, you could circumna- circumnavigate the Northern hemisphere, including seeing all of Europe, making a little side trip down to Morocco, going into Mongolia. You could do all of that for 40,000 bucks. Um, and you'll, you'll have something that will change your life. Yep. Um, and I think that starting off by saying, I'm not going to modify my vehicle unless it's absolutely necessary is the right place to start off with. And it doesn't mean that modifications aren't useful. They can be. And you may also just say, Scott, Matt, I really just want this widget on my car. That's cool. Go We're, for it. We totally get that. Um, but people that make the argument that they need it instead of want it, that's where we find the fallacy. That's where we find the limitation in the argument. Start off with things stock, keep it simple, buy the right vehicle to begin with, and then you're ready to go. Yep. It's, it's not that hard, right? Just yeah. stop messing with it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and that's difficult. It is difficult. Um, again, spend more money on the experiences than you do on the truck and you're well on your way to, uh, overlanding adventures. Yeah. And, and, and to contradict myself, if it makes your experience better, by all means go for it, you know, just don't make it too, uh, don't go too overboard. Yeah, that's right. And so. simplicity and reliability is the key to vehicle preparation for long distance overland travel. Uh, keep it reliable, keep it simple. And go have fun out there. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Really appreciate it. See you guys. All right. See ya.